Hi everybody, I hope this video finds you well. Uh, in today's video, we're gonna be studying into section 3.1 from your textbook, which is the beginning of defining a very important matrix property, which is called the determinant of a matrix. So in this video, we're going to sort of do some of the background work that is necessary for setting up the definition of the determinant. Um, it'll be a little bit of sort of a tangent at the beginning here because we've got quite a few sort of background things to talk about before we're able to define the determinant. So the actual definition of the determinant won't be until the second video uh, for section 3.1. In this video, we're just gonna be doing sort of background stuff, helping us get to this very, very sort of important uh, definition for matrices. So this is section 3.1, the definition of the determinant. So our sort of goal in this section is that we're gonna to try to define a property for square matrices that relates to invertibility. And the idea here is that if you have a matrix and you want to know if it has an inverse, the process that we sort of defined back in the section on the inverse of a matrix will work, but it is a very sort of uh, time-consuming and computationally intensive method, right? If you had a large square matrix, you have to go through that entire process of trying to reduce the matrix into the identity matrix using those row operations. And then if that process works, you then know that the matrix is invertible and you know it's inverse. But what if you're just interested in the invertibility? Not necessarily what is the inverse, but just does the matrix have an inverse? Well, the determinant is sort of a property that allows us to see that. Still going to be sort of computational in nature, but not nearly as bad as the entire process of reducing to a matrix into the identity matrix. So your book sort of lays out a couple base cases of like, one by one matrices, two by twos, three by threes that tries to motivate this uh, definition that we're gonna be building to. Uh, you can read your textbook on that if you're interested. For us, we're going to immediately sort of see the background stuff that we need, and then in the next video, actually give the definition of the determinant. Once we've given that definition, then we'll be able to see why it relates to invertibility. All right, so in terms of background stuff, we need to talk a little bit about what are called permutations. So. A permutation is just simply an ordering of the numbers one, two, three, through n. So it's basically an ordering of the whole numbers. So examples of this, sort of very straightforward, right? Something like one, four, two, three is a permutation of one, two, three, four, right? So this guy is what we would call a permutation of that set of four numbers. Whereas something like five, six, one, three, two, four, that is a permutation of one, two, three, four, five, six. So permutation just means some ordering, obviously without any sort of repeats, and it does use all of the values of some set of whole numbers starting from one. Uh, there's sort of a combinatorics theorem that probably maybe some of you guys have encountered if you've taken like a basic class in probability or something like that. Um, this theorem we're not going to prove, but we'll just state it. It says that if you have the numbers 1 through n, there are n factorial distinct permutations. So, uh, for example, right, uh, this is not a proof, but for example, if you have 1, 2, 3, well, then according to this, there should be 3 factorial equals three times two times one equals six distinct permutations. And because six is not too bad, we could just list those out. What would they look like? Well, they look like one, two, three. They would look like one, three, two. I guess you could have two, one, three, two, three, one, three, one, two, and three, two, one. Right? So those would be the six distinct permutations of the numbers one, two, and three. And we know, according to this theorem, that there are n factorial distinct permutations, depending on how many numbers we actually have. Why is it n factorial? Well, again, we're not going to go into the full proof, but you can sort of imagine when you're getting ready to create a permutation, you have all of the numbers, n choices for the first, then when you go to choose the next one, you have n minus one choices because you can't use the one that you used first. Then you have n minus two choices, so on and so forth. 
And every time you do that, you multiply. So you're getting n times n minus one times n minus two, so on and so forth. That's exactly what a factorial is. So it's reasonable to believe that there are n factorial distinct permutations. All right. We are going to be using these permutations because they're part of the definition of the determinant. But there's sort of an important property of these permutations that we also want to define. So we're going to talk about what are called the inversions of a permutation. So we're going to define inversions here. So we sort of consider the permutation 1, 2, 3, down to n as the natural order. So for our purposes, we're going to view the sort of increasing permutation that goes 1, 2, 3, all the way down to n as sort of the natural order. Okay. So for a given permutation, and usually the notation that we uh, sort of write for permutations is p1, p2, down to pn, where each of these sort of represent one of the values from 1, 2, 3, down to n, right? So for a given permutation, right, we consider, uh, well, let's say it this way, if p sub i is greater than p sub j with i less than j, then this is called an inversion. So in other words, an inversion right, is basically a value that is out of order. Because what this is sort of saying is that the value of the permutation is larger than some later value of the permutation, but its position is smaller. Meaning that one of these ones in the front is actually a larger value than one of the ones later on. Meaning it's out of that natural order. Then we sort of let this notation, so big N of p1, p2, down to pn, be the total number of inversions in the permutation. Okay. All right, so let's look at a couple examples of this because sometimes it's a little confusing exactly what this definition is sort of saying here. So let's just look at a couple uh, sort of quick uh, examples of calculating inversions. So as an example here, let's uh, consider the permutation. Uh, let's do 1, 3, 4, 6, 5, 2. Okay. So let's try to calculate the number of inversions here. So the best sort of easiest way to calculate the number of inversions is to start from the left-hand side, figure out how many inversions uh, include this guy, then include, see how many inversions include this guy, etc. So for this one here, right, we have to think, are there anything that are in sort of a later position but is a smaller value? So in that case, for this guy, there are, there are no such things. So for this first sort of element, there are zero inversions. What about for this three? Well, this four is bigger and it's later, which is good. The six is bigger and later, which is good. Five is bigger and later, which is good. But two is smaller and later, so there is one inversion there. So there's going to be one inversion for the 3. What about for the 4? Well, same thing. The 6 and 5 are good, but the 2 is later but smaller. So there is an inversion there. For the 6, well, unfortunately, both the 5 and 2 are smaller and later. So that's two inversions. For the 5, well, there's the 2 is smaller and later, so there is an inversion there. And then, of course, the 2, trivially, because it's the last element, will never have any inversions because there's nothing sort of later than it or in a later position. So this would tell us that the number of inversions of 1, 3, 4, 6, 5, 2 is actually equal to 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 1, which looks like 5. So there are five inversions present in this permutation. Now, if we were studying permutations just for the sake of permutations, right, and we weren't going to use them for anything else, what would be sort of interesting to sort of study is that this number of inversions actually matches how many swaps or how many sort of adjacent moves we need to make to actually take this thing and put it into order. 
So I want to just show you guys that in this one case. So if we have one, three, four, six, five, two, let's do some adjacent moves and put this thing in the natural order. So let's start by moving this two, one, two, three, four times to get it in the sort of right spot. So we're gonna swap, right? One, three, four, six, two, five. Then, uh, that's not an equals there, so let's just erase that guy there. That shouldn't be an equals. We're just doing swaps, so we'll go there. Then let's move the two again. So one, three, four, two, six, five. Okay, let's move the two again. One, three, two, four, six, five. And then we'll move the two again. One, two, three, four, six, five. Okay, is this guy in the natural order? Well, he's close. We just gotta swap those two. We can do that in one move. One, two, three, four, five, six. Well, what do we see here then? Well, how many moves did this take? Well, it took one, two, three, four, and five moves, which is exactly the number of inversions. So this number of inversions is a very sort of important property of a permutation. Let's take a look at one more example. We won't bother doing this on the next example. We'll just worry about calculating the number of inversions. But I just wanted you guys to see this sort of idea to realize that this number of inversions thing isn't just some made up of idea. It really relates to a fundamental concept of the permutation. So let's go ahead and I uh, consider this permutation. So let's consider the permutation uh, five, four, two, one, three. So whereas our first permutation was a permutation of one through six, this is only a permutation of one through five. Uh, let's go ahead and calculate the number of inversions here. If we start with the five, well, one, two, three, four things are all smaller, but in later positions, so there are four inversions for that guy. For the four, there are one, two, three things that are smaller and later in position, so there are three inversions there. For the two, only one thing is smaller in later position, so it would be one inversion. For the one, there is one thing in later position, but it actually is larger, so there are no inversions. And then, of course, like we said, the last guy always trivially has zero inversions. So the number of inversions in the permutation 5, 4, 2, 1, 3 is 4 plus 3 plus 1 plus 0 plus 0 is equal to 8 inversions. So by doing eight sort of adjacent swaps, you should be able to put this into the order of one, two, three, four, five. And you guys can try that on your own, see if you can make eight sort of adjacent swaps of elements, and you should be able to put this into the sort of standard order of one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so this number of inversions thing, um, very uh, sort of central to the idea of a permutation. For us, though, we're not going to be so interested in the exact number of inversions. We're actually going to be more interested in the parity of the uh, permutation or the number of inversions. So whether or not this is even or odd. So we're going to sort of make this next definition here. So the parity of a permutation. We call a permutation even if n of p1, p2, pn is even, and we call a permutation odd if n of p1, p2 down to pn is odd. So we basically use that same terminology of even and odd for a permutation based on whether or not the number of inversions is even or odd. For us, we're also going to give this definition, right? We are going to define that this sigma of a permutation is equal to negative one to the number of inversions. Note, right, that this means that this guy here is equal to positive one if uh, permutation is even, negative one if the permutation is 
odd, okay? So we're defining sort of the sign of a permutation, and we say that if the permutation is even, the sign is positive or positive one, and if the permutation is odd, then we define the sign to be negative or negative one. And the sort of mathematical way to do that is to just define it as negative one to the number of inversions. Of course, negative one to an even number will be positive, negative one to an odd number will be negative. That's all we're doing here. All right. After all of this, we are ready to sort of state the sort of big final theorem that we need about permutations. This theorem, uh, we will prove it. It'll be a little bit messy because permutations are always a little messy, but we will go through and prove it. And then in our next video, we will use this permutation stuff to define this matrix property. You guys shouldn't really expect to have to do too much with these permutations, but do keep in mind that as we prove and do other things with the determinant, we will often reference the definition of the determinant, which is based on this permutation stuff. So it is a good idea to have at least a solid sort of baseline understanding of permutations. All right, let's get to that big theorem then. So this is the sort of main theorem on permutations and parity, okay? So this theorem basically states the following. So uh, if you have a permutation P1 down to PI, down to PJ, down to PN, and you swap two elements, PI, PJ, creating the permutation P1 down to PJ, down to PI, down to PN, and then the following is true. That sort of sign of P1 to PI to PJ to PN is equal to negative the sign of the permutation P1 to PJ to PI to PN. So if we were stating this theorem in words, what we would say instead of using all this notation is that if you swap two things in a permutation, you cause the sign to change. If it was positive originally, it will now be negative. If it was negative originally, then it'll become positive. Okay. So we are going to prove this theorem, and to prove this, we sort of prove this theorem in two pieces. So we'll sort of draw a little line here and do our proof. So to start with, we're going to assume PI and PJ are actually adjacent. So we're going to assume, even though the theorem actually holds when wherever PI and PJ are, we're going to assume that initially they're actually adjacent. And then once we've proven this, we will then use that to finish the overall proof. So what we're gonna do then is we're gonna let PI actually equal P sub K, just to make the notation a little bit easier. And that makes PJ equal to PK plus one, because again, we're assuming that they're actually adjacent here. So that means our sort of original permutation looks like this, P1 down to PK, then PK plus one, then down to PN. And then our new one, so this is our sort of original permutation. And now our new permutation looks like that. Because what are we doing in this theorem? We're talking about what happens when you swap two elements, okay? All right, so let's break this down into the two possibilities, right? So if P sub K was greater than P sub K plus one, so if the number that is in here for P sub K is larger than P sub K plus one, then that means in here, these two were in the right order because P sub K, or excuse me, they were in the wrong order because P sub K was larger than P sub K plus one, meaning that there was a larger value here and then a smaller value here, which means that it was out of order. So when we go to do that swap, right, we're putting P sub K in its correct place. So what that tells us 
is that tells us that the number of inversions for our new permutation will be the number for the original permutation minus one. Why do we know that? Because like we said, by doing this swap here, right, you're actually putting that piece of k plus one, which is the sort of smaller value in the sort of correct spot relative to piece of k. That removes one of the inversions. So now the number of inversions is less by one, okay? In the other case, right, if p sub k was actually smaller than p sub k plus one, then of course, if this was the case, these two things were actually relative to one another in the correct order, smaller and then bigger. So when we flip them, right, that actually increases the number of inversions. So that means that the number of inversions for our new permutation is actually the same as the number of inversions for the original one plus one. Do we have to consider a case where p sub k and p sub k plus one are equal to one another? Definitely not, because remember what a permutation is. It is an arrangement of the numbers one through n. So every one of these p sub whatevers all have to be different values. So there's no case to say when they're equal to each other. All right, what this tells us is that the number of inversions for our new permutation is either one lower or one higher than the original one. But if you think about that, if you are one lower or one higher, then you are definitely a different parity, right? If your original permutation was even, going down one or up one from an even number makes it odd. If your original permutation was odd, then going down one or up one will make it even. So what this tells us, we'll just add an extra page here, is so the sort of sign of P1 of our new permutation is definitely going to be negative the sign of the original permutation because the parity will Okay, so what this shows us here is that this shows that the theorem holds in the case where the two things that you swap are adjacent to one another. Now we need to extend this to whether or not this holds regardless of the position of the elements. So now we need to do this even if p sub i and p sub j are not adjacent. Okay, but we're going to be able to use the idea that it works when they are adjacent. So let's go ahead and sort of rewrite where what we sort of have here. So our sort of old permutation, remember we're sort of viewing that as P1, then at some point we run into PI, then we run into PJ, and then we end at P sub n. And the new permutation uh, let's, let's give ourselves a little bit more space because we're going to actually write some stuff underneath that old permutation. And the new permutation is p sub 1, that doesn't change, then p sub j, then p sub i, and then p sub n, right? Because the, the idea is that we're swapping these two elements to here and here. Okay, so let's think about the number of adjacent moves that need to happen. So let's imagine taking this p sub i and moving him down one by one until he reaches that p sub j. So let's sort of imagine taking him and doing swaps until we reach p sub j. How many swaps are necessary? Well, if you think about it, if he was right next to him, their numbers would be, their, their indices would be off by one and you would need one swap. If their indices are off by two, you would need two swaps. So to do that, right, you need, if we sort of, we can mention that, you would need j minus i adjacent swaps. Okay, so you need j minus uh, i adjacent swaps to move this piece of i to where piece of j is. But if you do that, keep in mind piece of j 
won't be here. We'll then need to take the piece of J and move it the other way and move it back to where P sub I is. So how many swaps will you need there? Well, if you think about that, you're gonna already put it in this position. So you're gonna need to go there, there, and there. There'll be one less because when you do this final swap and you put P sub I where P sub J is, then P sub J will be right to the left there and it'll have one less to travel back. So that means that you will need J minus I minus one adjacent swaps. So overall, to move P sub I to where P sub J is and P sub J to where P sub I is, you need J minus I and then another J minus I minus one adjacent swaps. So this tells us to go To go from P sub 1, P sub I, P sub J to P sub N to P sub 1, P sub J, P sub I, P sub N, we need J minus I plus J minus I minus 1 adjacent swaps. So what can we say about J minus I plus J minus I minus one? Well, that would be two J minus I minus one adjacent swaps. Okay, well, two minus two times J minus I minus one. All you need to think about there is that two times anything right there, that's going to be an even number minus one, that's gonna make it odd. So we need an odd amount of adjacent swaps. Okay, that actually basically wraps up our proof because if we go back to what we showed here, we showed that if you swap two things that are actually adjacent, you will definitely negate the parity or the negate the sign. And now we just figured out that you're gonna do that an odd amount of times. So if you do that an odd amount of times, then this negative will happen an odd amount of times. An odd amount of negatives is always going to still be negative. So we can say that the sign or the parity of the original permutation, or sorry, of the new permutation, because that's how we've been sort of stating it, of the new permutation is going to be the negative of the original. Okay, so that's exactly what we wanted to show. So we'll put a little check mark there. Now, I know that this is sort of an abstract uh, sort of proof here, especially since permutations are probably relatively new to us. I don't want you guys to worry too, too much about this whole thing, but I do wanna just do one quick example to at least show you guys that this proof should be believable. So let's look at one sort of last example here, okay? So let's consider the permutations, let's do this guy, two, three, one, five, four. And uh, let's consider four, three, one, five, two. So according to our theorem, right, if we have these two permutations, you can see that these two permutations are the same, except that I swapped two and four, right? In this guy, I had two, then all this stuff, then four. And in this guy, I have the same stuff in the middle, but I swapped two and four. So in other words, these two were interchanged. So according to the previous theorem, these two must have opposite parities. So let's go ahead and actually calculate them. For the first one, for two, you can see that the one is going to count as an inversion. So there's one inversion for this guy. For the three, there is one inversion because the one is out of order. For the one, there are no inversions. For the five, there is one inversion. And for the four, there are zero. So we would get that the number for two, three, one, five, four is equal to three. And we would get that the sign of two, three, one, five, four is going to be negative one because you have an odd amount of inversions. By that theorem, we immediately know that the sign for this guy will be positive one. 
The previous theorem doesn't tell us how many inversions, but it will tell us that it is guaranteed that this guy will have a positive sign or an even parity. Let's actually check that though. So for the four, right? If we look, the four has one, two, three things that are out of order. So three, the three has one, two things that are out of order. The one has zero, the five has one, and of course the last thing always has zero. So if we look at that, the number of inversions for four, three, one, five, two is actually equal to three plus two plus one, which is six. And as that previous theorem guaranteed, the sign of that would then be positive one. And as guaranteed by the previous theorem, if you interchange two elements, then you will definitely change the sign of the permutation. And that's really all that big theorem was trying to show us. In the next video, we'll be able to use this permutation stuff to formally define the determinant of a square matrix.